Psalm 46.10. This is my favorite psalm and maybe my favorite scripture. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Moses was distracted by God. Distracted. In the bush that was on fire, but not consumed. At this point, right then, Moses was all alone. Unless you want to count the sheep. He had only sheep with him. And he was a fugitive from Egypt. He had been a fugitive for 40 years. He was a wanted man back in Egypt. If they had bounty hunters back then, they probably would have put a price on his head and, and sent some hunters after him. But they didn't know where he went. He didn't realize it, but he was a wanted man there in the desert also. Wanted by God. God wanted him. God had a job for Moses to do. At this time, Moses didn't know God. He knew about God. He knew he was a Hebrew. But this was 400 years after God made a way for Joseph to bring Jacob and the family down to Egypt. When he left there, it was exactly 430 years that the people were enslaved. And right now, they were enslaved at this point. It was 430 years that they were there. I don't know how many years they were enslaved. But God wanted Moses to bring them out. Out of slavery. Out of Egypt. They were, going to, they were to go to Canaan, the land that God had promised to their forefathers, to Abraham. Moses didn't think of himself as a leader except for leading the sheep. He tried to get out of the assignment, tried to get out of it. This was to be a very large job. Moses had been in Egypt 40 years before, so he knew how many people he had to lead out of there. The very thought of it was overwhelming. Send somebody else, he said. I don't speak well. And he tried to get out of it. But there were some people, it depends on how you interpret the Hebrew, 630,000 or 600,000 men, plus women and children, that would be a million and a half, maybe, maybe three million people. But there are different ways to interpret the sense of what that Hebrew says. And some think it was 60,000. And some think it was 30,000. If you do a study on that. But what it says is 600,000 in the uh, translation from Hebrew to English. But God says in Exodus uh, 4.13... He said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send somebody else. But God decides who he's going to use. God decides. <laughs> he chooses unlikely people, unlikely people to do the task. He could have used one of the elders in Israel that was there in, in Egypt. But God has a plan. He does things his way. Noah was an ordinary man. He didn't have a degree in nautical engineering. He didn't have a shipyard. God said, build me an ark. An ark is a box. They picture this ark like it has a, a bow on a bow, prow, a bow on the front, and a keel. It didn't have a keel. It didn't have any sails. It didn't have any rudder. It was only a boat because it floated. But it was a, basically a box. And it floated, therefore it was a boat. Whatever makes your boat float. But he, he didn't have a, he didn't know how to do that. God guided him. He was just an ordinary guy. He wasn't a brilliant nautical engineer. 
King David was a shepherd boy when he killed Goliath. Just a shepherd boy. And Joseph was a slave when he went down into Egypt. And God chose him to save a large part of mankind there because there was a terrible, terrible drought and he was able to advise Pharaoh what to do about that drought and Pharaoh put him in charge. So he was the prime minister of the land. He started out as a, as a slave. God gave him that plan. It wasn't his idea. God gave him that plan. Mary was just a young girl. Something, maybe she was 14 years old or so. Mary Magdalene was a sinner, it says, a sinner in that town. That's all we know about her background. Peter was a fisherman. He knew how to read the currents in the water and how to cast a net and how to bring the net back in. He didn't know how to get up and be a public speaker. Most of the early disciples were just uneducated common people. God decides who he's going to use. We refer to that as a calling. It doesn't have anything to do with your abilities. I didn't have any ability to get up and speak. God called me to do it. I was a lay preacher for, I think, 17 years before I started studying for ministry. And I thought that was fun. But the first time I did it, I was a little shook up about it. The second time, I was a little easier. The third time, did pretty well. Then I started craving opportunities to speak. That was all, God was doing all that. I don't have training like that. But to be used by God, all you have to do is be willing. You just have to say, yes, I'll do that. Sometimes the calling is momentary. It involves a certain person that calls you and needs prayer or that you see that's hurting. Yeah, yes, yes, Lord, I'll, I'll take care of it. So back to Moses in Exodus chapter 4, verse 29 to 31. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites. And this was, he was already in Egypt at this point. Verse 30, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. Aaron did the talking because Moses didn't speak very well, and that was God's idea. He said, well, your brother's coming, he speaks, so I'll tell you what to say to him, and he can speak to the people. But he also performed signs before the people so that they would believe him because they didn't know who Moses was. It was 40 years before that. So God had given Moses power to do miracles. Throw your stick down, it'll become a snake. Pick it back up, it'll become a staff again, etc. And so they believed in verse 31. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down. They bowed down and worshipped. They didn't know that. Moses told them through Aaron what God had said. I see. I see the people. I see the misery. And I'm going to do something about it. And you're the one that's going to lead them out. So when they found out about that, they worshipped. So this was a great turning point for the Israelites. Their life was drudgery, without hope. They had been slaves for so many years that there weren't any alive that were never slaves. Don't know how many years it was. Maybe 300 years. There was nobody alive that could remember not being a slave. It was 430 years from the time Jacob went to Egypt and was reunited with Joseph until Moses led them out. 430 years to the day, Scripture says. As the story continues, Moses and Aaron confront Pharaoh and he refuses to let the people go. Frogs 
gnats, flies, death of the Egyptian livestock, all these plagues one after another after another, and, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he kept saying, no, you're not going, and hail came, boils, hail, locusts, thick darkness, and finally, the death of all the firstborn except for the Israelites because they had the sign of the blood of the Lamb across and down on their doorposts. And when the death angel came to a house like that that was marked in that way with the blood of the Lamb, he passed over them. That's what they call, they call it the Passover. And they still, the Jewish people still celebrate that, the Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, 29 to, 31, 9, 30, 29 to 31, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. During the night Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said up leave my people you and the Israelites go worship the Lord as you have requested. So they thought they had that he had enough of them and was telling them to get out now. So they left the land of their enslavement and God used Moses to bring them out. But they would face one more huge obstacle. You know what that was? The Red Sea. You knew. You guys knew that. Nobody was raising their hand. The Red Sea. Pharaoh changed his mind. Actually, God hardened Pharaoh's heart so he would be glorified in what he was about to do. In Exodus chapter 14 and verse 4, he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this, referring to a change in direction. See, they, they went one way and they came around. God's plan was to have them up against the Red Sea because he knew the Egyptian army would be coming. God set the whole thing up. God sets things up. You ever been set up you've ever been set up by God yeah you don't know what he's doing but after it after it comes through you know that God that was awesome the way you set that up so picking it up on verse in verse 5 Exodus 14 5 when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. This is what's pretty cool right here. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The 600 best chariots and all the rest of the chariots too and his whole army. He came after them with everything that he had. He came after the Israelites with everything he had. Do you ever feel like something's coming after you with all they got? You ever feel like that? We all do. Now what? What could possibly happen next? Verse 8, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Hahirath, Opis, Baal, Siphon. So God set this whole thing up. There was no place for them to go. Their backs were at the Red Sea with the full force of Egypt after them. 
the full force. There was nowhere to go. Water's back here, Egyptian army, all the chariots. Talk about being between a rock and a hard place. And they, and they kind of panicked. In 14 verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. And they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. When you get terrified about something, cry out to the Lord. <laughs> they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. But what was their servitude to the Egyptians like? They had their, their taskmasters beat them. And they had issued a decree that they could they weren't going to be given any more straw. They, made, they were brick makers. They made bricks out of mud. That's what they were doing. But you have to have some straw as a filler. And they weren't going to give them any more straw. They said you have to have the same quota, the same number of bricks you got to make. And we're not giving you any straw. You got to go find your own straw. So they're out pulling up stubble and using it for straw. It was much harder. But they thought that'd be better than what they saw with this water back here and the army up here. So here's Moses' answer. And this is the heart of the sermon today. Moses answered the people in verse 13. Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. You ain't going to see them no more in the vernacular. That threat, you ain't going to see it again. But they saw it. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. That's the message today. There were 600,000 men plus women and children. Some scholars contend, based on the Hebrew, that it's different numbers. But it doesn't matter. If there were 600,000, maybe they could repel an attack from the Egyptian army. They probably had some swords. I don't know. They weren't trained. They were military people. They were brick makers, among other things. So Pharaoh came at them with everything that he had. The whole works. Everything. There are things in life that cause us to be in fear. We have an enemy that hates us. We have an enemy that tries to destroy us. The enemy does everything he can to keep us from bringing glory to God. Just like Pharaoh, he comes at us with everything he has. The whole load, sometimes. Just when we think we have the victory, something else shows up on the horizon of life. Something threatening comes along. These people had just escaped from their oppressors, from their taskmasters, from the ones who whipped them if they didn't make enough bricks. They came out with all their belongings. They came out with livestock. Everything seemed cool. They got away. Fortunes turned quickly. Everything could seem just great. And your house burns down. You lose everything. Everything can seem just great. And a flood takes your house. That's what happened to Clyde and Sherry. And everything you have. Or the death of a child. Tragedies happen. Or the doctor says the dreaded word, cancer. The things that are going on in the world makes me wonder, 
how long is God going to hold back? How long before Jesus comes back? How long? The people are making the most noise in Washington are Marxists in their hearts and Marxism hates God, hates the nuclear family, hates that you can have private property. They're haters. And they're prominent. How long? So Moses had three recommendations and a promise. His first recommendation was fear not. Sometimes this is the hardest thing to do. When Pharaoh's coming, when the sheriff is coming, when the bills are piling up, when the doctor says you're in more trouble than you think you are. Sometimes it's hard to, to be without fear when life's trials come along. Lose your job. How are you going to pay the bills? Need surgery? How are you going to work? I hear there are people right around us with food insecurity. That's why they have these food giveaways. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. There's no other hand that we want to hold us up except for the hand of God. That's the most powerful hand, and he extends it to us. So no matter what comes against you, concentrate on the goodness of God. He's always there. and get in your face don't panic panic is the way of the world we're in the world but we are no longer of the world we can still praise our God he loves us stand stand on the things that are spiritually dependable stand on the word of God Amen. we must have a word life I need a dose every day I start every day with scripture I managed to read all of it in one year and I think this is the 27th or 8th 20th year I'm going through then stand in prayer. We need to have a prayer life connected to the Savior through prayer. Every day, most of every day. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18, it says, Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. King James says, pray without ceasing. And if you think about that, that's not something that's possible to do because you can only do one thing in your mind at a time. But that means not to cease being a prayerful person. That doesn't mean you have to have a prayer coming out of your mouth 24-7. That means don't cease to be a prayer person. You catch that? Pray without ceasing. Pray continually. Because if you let your spirit be open to God, there's always something that pops into your mind that needs to be prayed for. You can do that while you're driving along, while you're washing the dishes. You could do that. And you should. Stand in prayer. Then he said, and then stand in the spirit. Be spirit filled. Be strong. In your faith, you may be weak in the flesh, 
and most of us are except for Shawnee and Richie back there <laughs> those are our youngsters but you can be strong in the spirit 2 Corinthians 12 10 that is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses in insults in hardships in persecutions in difficulties for when I am weak then I am strong weak in the world but strong in God the older we get the weaker we get but the closer to God we are, the closer to the day when we see him face to face, when we look into the eyes of Jesus and see the flames of love from his heart to us, fall on our knees and thank him. It's going to be so exciting. Then the third recommendation he said is be still. Being still is standing in faith there was nothing the Israelites could do in their own power to prevail against the armies of Pharaoh they couldn't do anything there will be times when it seems like there was no possible way for you no way to victory no way to success no matter what Avenue you use things are blocked off closed off no way to triumph that's because we're bound in our thinking by our natural mind. Step aside and watch God work. If you give your problem to God, leave it there. <laughs> Some of us give our problem to God and pick it back up again. Most of us maybe do that sometimes. But don't pick it back up again. My favorite psalm is Psalm 4610. We open with that. Be still and know that I am God. In our stillness is faith. If we start moving and trying to solve things ourselves, then that's we're, we're trying to do it ourselves. If we have faith in God, be still, know that I am God, and just give it to God and leave it to Him. He'll take care of it in his own way and in his own time. And sometimes what happens will not seem like a victory, but if that's what God is doing, then that's what God is doing. Amen? Amen. He said, the Lord will fight for you. We face a lot of trials. If you haven't faced trials, they're coming. <laughs> they're coming, Johnny. If you haven't faced any yet, they're coming. We're living in a sinful world. There's hostility towards God. There's hostility toward the message of the gospel. The message we carry is the only escape from eternity in hell. Can't be any more plain spoken than that. Our enemy doesn't want anyone to escape from perdition because he's going to be in there himself forever and ever. He tries to stop the message. The battle belongs to God. It's his battle, 1 Samuel 17, 47. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. That was spoken by David to Goliath <laughs> before he killed him, before he destroyed the giant. Zechariah 4, 6, So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. By the spirit of God, victory is won. The victory is his. The battle is his. The victory is his. He does it for us because he loves us. But it's always for his glory. 
Well, you know what happened? Moses was told to put his stretch out his rod and the sea was divided. There was a wall of water on up here, a wall of water over there, and the Israelites went through that on dry ground and the, and the armies and chariots of the Pharaoh went in after them and God closed the sea over them and they all drowned. He caused their, some of the wheels to come off of the chariots. You will see. Stand still. Stand. You will see. So what about you today? You know, where's the pain? What's on your horizon? Is it heartache? Is it pain in your body? Is it you wonder what's going to happen next? 1 Samuel 12, 16 says, Now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Sometimes a victory isn't what it looks, it doesn't look like a victory. Our precious friend Connie fought cancer. How long? Three years? Can you remember, Scotty, how many years that was? But Connie battled cancer. Was it three years? And we prayed for her and trusted God. And she would seem like she was getting better. Her numbers were better and going down and the chemo was working and she would... And then, and then eventually they, they went to another church, but we never stopped praying for them. We never stopped trusting God for victory for her. And she went into the presence of God. She went into eternity. How can you say that's not a victory? It is a victory. It's the ultimate victory. When that happens, you leave some sad people behind. You have a husband, kids and grandkids, and the memory uh, of Connie, you know. She was a precious person to us. And because God decided to take her home, that doesn't mean there's no victory. It means God's doing things His way and in His time. And that's all it means. And God is to be praised anyway. Even if things don't turn out the way I think they should or we think they should. Stand still. Stand still. So do you have, um, do you have a, something you need? Would you start that last uh, video there? Do you have something that's on your horizon?